I'm very pleased to welcome Lee Smolin to the Popper Society. Uh, Lee is a theoretical physicist, a faculty member at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, and an adjunct professor of physics at the University of Waterloo. Uh, he has made contributions to the foundations of quantum theory, as well as quantum gravity, in particular, the approach known as loop quantum gravity. And Lee has also written several books, the most recent of which is uh, his book, Einstein's Unfinished Revolution, the search for what lies beyond the quantum, which I've been reading and highly recommend. Uh, I especially appreciate its defense of scientific realism and its overview of the different interpretations of quantum theory. And um, Lee will give a talk. And I, yeah, again, thanks very much for joining us. It's great having you. Okay. And also, I should say um, that interruptions during the talk are welcome, as long as they're brief. And afterwards, there will be a QA. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, so you didn't like the last third of the book which is where I present my own theory. So that's, I'll do that now, make up for that. No, um, in way of introducing myself, I am a theoretical physicist, although I have had much, spent much time with philosophers very fruitfully and very importantly over the years. I've worked on foundations of quantum mechanics and quantum gravity principally. And I, although I haven't succeeded in finding the quantum theory of gravity or the completion of quantum mechanics, I have a clear pathway that I believe may go to it. And that's taken a long time to develop. And for philosophers, this involves a program called temporal naturalism. For physicists, it's called the either energetic causal sets or the causal theory of views. Those are a bit technical, but I hope to communicate something of what they're about. Um, I take this as an informal presentation. So as Sam said, I'm happy to be interrupted for brief discussion and we'll have, I hope, a lot of discussion at the end. Um, my understanding is that you are a mixed audience. There are some professional philosophers who may find what I want to say here appalling, but I hope that I hope I'll convince you there is some logic in what I'm doing. And there are also non-professional philosophers. And um, let's let's just start off. I have some slides, but I won't rely entirely on them. Um, and I have I have before I get started, I have to thank my collaborators, some of whom are on the screen, most of whom are on the screen. This has been a project in which I couldn't have gone anywhere without the collaboration of all of the people there over the years. And because the views involved are so different from the views that I started with and most of my friends and colleagues in theoretical physics still amazingly hold, so what are those views and what are the views that I've come here to present? So the view that most people in theoretical physics and many philosophers to my amazement hold about the nature of time is that time is an illusion. We appear to ourselves, we naively feel like we're caught in a moment of time, which is one of a succession of moments but many people who are professional philosophers or theorists or cosmologists prefer to think that, that sense we have of a world drenched in time, forever moving and changing, is an illusion, and that we should no longer we should no more consider it fundamental than to consider the distinction between being in Oxford or Toronto or Lagos. Uh, they're different points of view, but they're not fundamentally different. They, we disregard them when we look for um, true and fundamental facts about the world. And they say we should disregard the difference between the past, the present, and the future. So I disagree with that. And I'm going to start with an informal presentation of the view without making any attempt to justify it. And then I'll pause to see if anybody wants to comment at that point. 
And then I'll go into a more formal part of the talk, which will try to justify the view that I'm about to present. The view that what well, the first part of the talk is drawn partly from a paper and draft by Krela Verde. And um, you'll see, let me just march into it and we'll see. It's, it's meant to answer the question, if you're a presentist and you believe that what's real is real only in a moment, which is one of a succession of moments, um, what would you make of quantum mechanics? And this is inspired by remarks of a very important person in quantum mechanics. And maybe I'll see if the audience is alert by asking the guests who said this. It's very early in the development of quantum mechanics and somebody said, the past can never be described by a wave function or a quantum state. Wave functions and quantum states apply only to a description of the future. Anybody have any idea who that was? Okay, well, let's launch into, it was Werner Heisenberg. And, and so the view that I'm presenting here is, has kind of been a, a hidden view in the history of quantum mechanics. We find from time to time, somebody ruminating in this direction. So the work with Kralia that we did is looked for a, a way to pack into quantum mechanics, a meaningful distinction between the past, the present and the future in order to try to understand what Heisenberg might have meant by that. And the idea is on the screen here. Um, we, we, for various reasons, we, uh, we don't find useful to just start off and say there's the past, there's the present and the future. We find it more useful to start with a single distinction between things that are definite and things that are indefinite. And examples of things that are definite are the, the observables in classical physics where a particle has a definite position at all times in a definite trajectory. Something that is indefinite is a description in terms of a wave function, which is not in an eigenstate of position, mm -hmm. which is indefinite because you can have superpositions of states where the particle is in different places. So the problem with trying to be an ordinary presentist or we could say a naive presentist and just say that the future is unreal, the past doesn't exist, and all that exists is the present, is that you end up talking, meaning trying talking as if you sound like there's an object of discussion when you talk of the future. When what you'd really like to say is just that the future doesn't exist yet. And you ascribe properties to things in the past, but what you really want to say is that the past existed at one instance and we're in another instance and the past no longer exists. So there are no facts of the matter about either the past or the future. There are records in the present about the past. So what we want to avoid is being a kind of crypto black universe person in which we really believe that the world has a past, a present and a future. And there's this kind of moving green line which is the present, which is what we're experiencing. So we're gonna reject all of that and try to base the world on one distinction between indefinite and definite. And this is Claudia's idea, and I hope I do well presenting it. So presentists and people like that often speak of becoming, the world is forever becoming over and over again, the, we, the world is always a new, there's always a next moment. And what we mean by becoming or for something to happen is for something indefinite to become definite. And that is what we call an event. So do you see that that's enough to pack? Well, let's go into it, but it's enough to pack a lot more in that meaningfully than past, present and future. 
So only the becoming, the transition from indefinite to definite is real. And that reality, those transitions from indefinite to definite make up what we call the present moment. So you see where this is coming from. Um, this is a world with time, but no space. This present moment so far has no structure. It's a collection of transitions or events or happenings or becomings which somehow share existence. And that's what the world is fundamentally. It, it, we're gonna unpack more structure and try to find out where things like space and so forth come from. But at the, in the fundamental level, that's it. We have things that are indefinite, things that are definite, and what's real is transitions amongst them. And you see that that's modeled on the transition that Copenhagen people like to talk about between being in a quantum world and having indefinite states and being in a classical world where things get, quote, measured and you have quantum states resolving themselves into classical states. But the Copenhagen people had this arbitrary boundary between the quantum world and the classical world. And we're just moving that boundary to the distinction between indefinite and definite, making it fundamental. And it gives rise to the distinction between the past and the future, the present being the moment of transition. So how we give this some structure? Um, some, I think someone in the uh, call wants to ask a question, if that's all right. Sure, go ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead, David. Just unmute. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes, hi, uh, David. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask just for clarity, <laughs> for definiteness. Uh, you said only the transition is real. Yes. So the definite things and the indefinite things are not real. Yeah. Only the transition between them is if, real. Yes, and let's see if I can get if we can get away with it. Okay. Now I'm adding some structure, and this is a point where I expect some people will yell at us. We're going to have endow these events with some properties, and here I'm very inspired by Galen Strassen, who once told me very sternly, you think you're a relationalist, but you can't have just relations. You have to have something to relate. And this, of course, is a criticism of what's called the causal set approach to quantum space time, in which there are just events which are featureless and propertyless, except for their causal relations. So we're giving some stuff to for the relational relations which we have in our little story, which are just causal relations. And this is energy and momentum, among other things. So one of the things that becomes definite in the transition is some energy and momentum. Also, we are going to assume uh, some very simple laws which govern the endowing of Trend of events from prior events with energy and momentum so as to guarantee their conservation. Now, somebody is likely to, to want to interrupt at this point and say, wait a minute, you can't have energy and momentum without space and time because energy is the conserved quantity that is due to the symmetry of time translation and momentum is the quantity which is exist due to the symmetry of spatial trans translation. And we say, that's your story and this is our story. We're formally turning it around. And the name of that relationship I just spoke about is Nether's theorem. And we are calling on formally an inverse of Nether's theorem. That is, we're going to endow our events with energy and momentum, which are conserved as they are passed to each new event, each new becoming. And that those conservation laws are going to let us 
assemble space. And I won't, since this is not a talk for experts, I won't be telling you in detail how that occurs, but there are many papers. And um, here in, in all of this work about the structure of the relationship between causal sets and energy momentum, it's what we call energy, energetic causal sets. And Marina Cortez was the main person who developed these. Okay, now we also have structure of causation or causality. That is each event, the events don't happen for no reason. Each event happens because it's caused by previous events. And each event therefore has antecedents or quote parents and descendants or quote children. And there may be rules in the little game about how many and how, what kinds and so forth, but we're just going here to the basics. Now, that's the main structure. And now I'm gonna introduce a very important idea, which is the view of an event. And now people, if you go to a quantum gravity conference, we're always mm -hmm. talking about observables. What's observable? You think this is observable. I think that's observable. I think they're on boundaries. I don't know. I think you have to solve some very, it inverts some very complicated nonlinear differential equations and then you can have observables. Um, we have a very simple approach to that question. First of all, we're realists. So we want to talk about beables from John Bell, not observables. And here are the set of beables. If you can locate an event by some of the things that happen there, by some of the information that is related to that event from its antecedents, then you can ask questions about what else is true at that event. In other words, you can, if an event the, the closest thing we experience to a raw event is just look around for a moment and you see a display of colors and so forth. And those are quanta coming at you with different energies. And that is your view of the world. And if you think microscopically, every microscopic event has a view and it's incoming quanta labeled by energies. And that actually is a consistent um, set of uh, beables. And in other words, in quantum theory, all of those variables commute with each other. So we can talk about them as beables. And I'm going to be focusing on the views of events. In other words, my description of a quantum universe, our description of a quantum universe is, remember I said only the transitions are real, the events and what properties the events have include the views, the directions from which and the energies which the quanta which constitute, whose meaning constitutes the event is the beables of the event. And so if you, you're not stretching things too much, um, if you imagine that this is a view of a universe, which is made up of partial views of itself. All that is real in this universe is these momentary events and what they know about their causal past or what they could see there be, being, you know, anthropomorphizing it. Okay, anybody want to yell at me? Can I, do, is the view of the views clear? Um, of course, there's a lot of technical development to make this thing work. And I suggest you look at the papers or ask me later. So let me just draw some other conclusions from the, the world I described. Um, many physicists believe that the world is time reversal invariant. And 
We don't. Um, we want to say the direction from indefinite to indefinite at each event gives the universe an arrow of time. And there's a long discussion to be had, which I'll, I'm happy to have if somebody wants to raise their hand as to why that is consistent with everything we know. Most of my friends prefer to think that the world is symmetric and a reversal of time. And the fact that it is so manifestly asymmetric in our observations and experience is something to be explained. Um, and we take the opposite view. We take the view that the world is asymmetric in time, fundamentally. And the fact that there are some laws which appear to some approximation to be symmetric under time reversal is what needs to be explained. And I can talk about how we aim to explain it. Okay. So that's the quote that in some sense, our view unpacks. This formulation makes it clear that the uncertainty relations do not refer to the past. That's Werner Heisenberg. Um, this, I, since the game didn't go very well, I will tell you in a minute who these quotes are attributable. But if somebody wants to guess, statements about the past cannot in general be made in quantum mechanical language. We can describe a uranium nucleus by a wave function, including an outgoing alpha particle wave, which determines the probability that the nucleus will decay tomorrow. But we cannot describe by means of a wave function the statement, this nucleus decayed yesterday at 9 a.m. Greenwich time. As a general rule, knowledge of the past can only be expressed in classical terms. My second general conclusion is that the role of the observer in quantum mechanics is solely to make the distinction between the past and future. Any, any guesses? Hawking. No, that, that's... that's Whoever it. said it, it's really bore. All three quotes. It's really bore? Yes. I'd love, I'd love to discuss that sometime. This is Freeman Dyson, who we very much missed just a few years ago. Okay, and I won't burden you with all of that. Um, for eternally and always, there is only now, one and the same now. The present is the only thing that has no end. So that's a more romantic version of the thought. And of course that is, no, Schrodinger, who of course liked to romanticize everything. Okay, so um, I've gone about half an hour. Why don't I go a little bit into the next set of slides and I'm happy to stop whenever anybody wants to have a, a, a discussion. But I have presented a view of the world and just to summarize it in this view, the only thing that's the only really universal distinction is the distinction between definite and indefinite. Uh, an instance or an event is an instance of a transition from indefinite to definite. These are events. Events are have other properties. So we're not a th relational theory of relations. We're a relational theory of some stuff that stuff being energy and momentum and charges and so forth that I didn't discuss. And we make a structure called an energetic causal set from the causation of new events from just past events, which transmit energy and momentum in such a way that they're conserved. Um, and that is, that is the world, the beables, which give a complete description of it, are the views of all the events, which are roughly speaking, not roughly speaking, precisely the energy and momentum and other charges at, that exist at that event by virtue of being passed or transmitted from their antecedent events. So 
and that's that's the world um and it's i it's a very empty world if you're used to thinking that the world implicitly is not just the present and what we see around us going into the past but a long past back to the big bang and before many maybe many times and the long future um, this is a much more fragile world it recreates itself moment by moment by moment and just happens to do that it doesn't nothing persists nothing exists and so forth so you may i think it's a good question to ask at this point is what question is this an answer to i mean why pretend to be philosophical i mean you can tell the difference between a real philosopher and me which we we don't have to be embarrassed and criticize me on that basis but i'm certainly not doing philosophy in a conventional way um, using philosophical ideas and anybody who knows a little bit about the history of philosophy can pin Leibnizian on me and talk about this as an attempt to realize the monadology and so forth but as physics what questions is this the answer to well the first question I have to ask if this is the world is what happened to space and how do i get it back because as i emphasize there's no even though i'm waving my arms around space you may get the visual impression that these events live in space they don't there's no mention of space in the formulation of the theory if for experts if i write i have an action principle which describes this world and solve the action principle and we we talk we have detailed models which which are evolved from solutions of the action principle and the action principle has energy and momentum in it it mentions those but it doesn't mention space it mentions events and causation but it doesn't at all mention space so what, how do we get the world we live in back is a legitimate question. Um, where, if space is not fundamental, if it's not at the bottom level, where do we get it from? And this, if you're a physicist, is a key question, because if you're a physicist, you want to do dynamics. And that is, you want to just not make statements about what the world consists of, you want to have laws or something awfully like laws that you can understand that explains why things happen and gives a good explanation that is testable and so forth. And all of that is usually couched in the language of things in space, moving in space, changing in space, in Newton's theory of gravity, forces fall off like one over the distance squared. That's a measure of space. In Maxwell's theory, there are fields. And in modern quantum field theory, there are quantum fields, which live at points of space and depend on their functions or functionals or operator value distributions on space. Um, we have derivatives, so we measure how things change when we move in space. So where are we going to get that from? And here's the next concrete suggestion. The next concrete suggestion is, well, we have these views, and that's really all we have. So the only kind of question we can ask if we're going to build a dynamical theory is how are the views different from each other? Says rather than having a language in terms of where things are and how they move, we're going to have a language for dynamics in terms of how different are the views. That is, formally, there's a space on which the views live, and there's a metric on that space, which tells me how different two views are. And that's all I need to frame a dynamic. 
So let me talk about this informally and try to get you used to it, but in the following way. Um, we've jettisoned the idea of near and far, but we have something which is not unrelated to that. We have similar and different, and we have a measure of that. So it's very naive to say, if you look around you and I look around me, um, we see very different views. The patterns of energies or colors on the two-dimensional surface, which is basically our sky or a backward light cone, if we think classically, are rather different. Now that's probably because we're in different rooms and it doesn't really signify much. But if we think about this for two events just happening somewhere in the universe, there is a rough correlation between near and similar and far and dissimilar. And that's how we're gonna get back a standard physics in a certain limit based on notions of space. But notice that the, you can, this can go wrong. That is, if you look at systems which are very small and have very few degrees of freedom, it can happen. There are not that many views as systems that are big and have many degrees of freedom. So it can happen and will happen in the big universe accidentally that systems that when some measure of distance on the average emerges, there will be a disordering of the notion of locality in which two systems, which in that overall notion of locality that we're hoping emerges will still be very similar. And if I have a law that rather than saying that the strength of an interaction falls off like the distance, squared, but I might have a law that says the strength of an interaction falls off like the similarity squared. I'm sorry, in, yes, um, increases, but as a repulsion in the distance squared, in the similarity squared, then there's going to be a lot of interactions between things that naively you would think are far apart. And I can show that that's where quantum mechanics comes from. That is, in this, using this dynamics of this Lagrangian that I mentioned, I can, with taking certain limits, and this is again technically past the talk, but it's in the papers, I can derive quantum mechanics as an approximate description of those non local interactions. So that's some of the questions we're asked, we're answering. Where does quantum mechanics come from? Where does the non-locality of quantum physics come from? And so on. Okay, and we're not. So now is a good time if somebody wants to make a remark or answer, ask a question. Um, maybe I have a question. I, so I'm, you, do I understand correctly that you're trying to have this notion of similarity and that this gives rise to, to space? So you have these events um, yeah. and, and then there's some kind of relationship between them, which you call similarity, and, and that gives rise to a notion of space. To a notion of distance, yes. Right. Um, isn't that in some way supposing that there is such a thing as space, like the fact that you have to build that into the model? Um, isn't that uh, a big assumption that will uh, is, is, is there to give you back space or, or is it a, a, an assumption that's there for other reasons and then results in space accidentally? Yeah, so let me tell you what happens in a tiny bit of detail. I have all those conservation laws I mentioned and for every event is a conservation law. And some of you who, who have had enough of the physics training know that if I have a conservation law and I'm trying to construct an action principle, I can use a Lagrange multiplier 
to express that conservation law as part of the action principle. And that Lagrange multiplier lives in the dual of the space where the momentum and the energy and other charges live because it enforces their conservation. So I have little pieces of a dual of, of momentum space. That is, if I solve the equations of motion from that action principle, I find that there's an amount of momentum transmitted between two events and the Lagrange multipliers in those events look like little po two points in a dual space to a little piece of momentum space. And so I have a lot of pieces, little pieces of space time, which are, and the conservation laws tie them together. Now, then the inverse Nevis theorem essentially tells you that if you can satisfy consistently all the conservation laws that are generated by the Lagrange multipliers, you can sew these little pieces of space together to make big pieces of space. And that's how flat space in the Newtonian limit or in the relativistic version of Minkowski space time emerges. Does that help? Yeah, so as, as I understand it now, uh, you have these conservation laws and you take them to be primary. And yes. from those, uh, from the fact that they exist and from the fact that there are these events, you recover space and time. Well, I recover, I don't recover, I have little pieces of spaces that don't fit together in the general case. If I'm thinking, and we often are thinking in terms of a path in the growth, but we have uh, what we call a half integral. There, the, the fundamental variables in this theory are energy, momentum, and causal structure. So I can write an integral, a functional integral over those choice of variables. And there's a functional integral over energy and momentum at, on each causal relation. But there's no integration over points which would be trajectories. There's just the conservation laws and the, the changes of momentum. So I have a path integral which has momentum but no position, energy, but no time in the sense of a global time coordinate. And therefore there's no commutation relations, there's no H bar. So this gives uh, what we call the half integral formulation of this action principle that I was mentioning. And what, what we mean by the emergence of space is that all these little causal relations, all these little, sorry, relations that come from conservation laws, if you can solve them consistently, all these little, I think of them as like little shards of glass, line up and hook up together to give you a large piece of space. Now, in the generic case, the that doesn't happen. In the generic case, you can't solve the conservation laws globally consistently. And you have a dynamics that that has solutions. No, I take that back. You have a dynamics that doesn't really generate a solution. In the case that you can fit everything together, you have a consistent solution, you have a description of the events being related to each other in a time coordinate, which is happening in space. And so you can get a description, which is in space. And not only is in space, but in a certain limit is even the time mechanics or relativistic mechanics. Um, there are some cases we've studied in large detail 
um, you won't be surprised to hear that if the momentum is, if there's just one dimension of momentum, so it's something like a one plus one dimensional system that when you do a merge of uh, regions of space-time, the regions of one plus one dimensional Minkowski space-time. And Marina has done a lot of numerical simulations on how those space-times form and evolve into the future. And there's some interesting things we've learned. There's some phase transitions in that model, which are interesting. In the three dimensional case, three plus one dimensional case, I think I know, but we haven't, I'm embarrassed to say we don't know the full answer. Okay. Great, I think Adam has a question, if there's an opportunity. Yes, please go ahead. Great, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Smolin. It's, uh, thank you for the talk. I, I have to say I'm a little starstruck. <laughs> I was actually at Penn State uh, 20 years ago as an undergraduate when you were there and I never had an opportunity to interact with you. So this is like uh, bringing together a, a long-term regret. So thank you for the talk. Thank you for saying something so nice. <laughs> yeah. um, so <clears throat> I, have a, I may have a question, but I have a clarification first, which may clear up my question. Um, Am I to understand that what's fundamental is this transition from the indefinite to the definite? That's our picture. I see. And so <clears throat> then my question is kind of con conceptual because mm -hmm. you're talking, uh, it, it's about uh, continuity. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're thinking about um, causality and the continuity through time, um, but what's fundamental is this, <clears throat> transition from indefinite to definite so are you then thinking of how it you know if i'm thinking of just a simple particle and how it goes along uh this dynamics is 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 the across thing and it it is there at each moment a transition from indefinite to definite as that particle goes along or is the particle once it's definite it can stay definite and be sustained in some way is so, the question clear? Yes, the question is clear. Um, can I break it into two parts? Certainly. Uh, because I don't have to, but I should, if, if I'm giving you the full picture, separate the language of indefinite to definite and so forth from the dynamics of these energetic causal sets, which were studied before and the former is a kind of new and intentionally um, provocative interpretation of the former. So I can answer your question in the energetic causal sense, and then I'll translate it into the new language of indefinite and definite. So, and let me, let me think. Give me the end of your, the end of your question again, because I had a thought which I've lost. I sure. <clears throat> um, is about um, if, if we think of a, uh, something that's definite oh, yes, yes. and sustained. The, yeah. The, the emergence of particles. So yeah. we're starting with a world where there are just events. And those events are transitions from indefinite to definite. Those events, there is a dynamics that is specified that sets of those events give rise to new events. As I described, an event has parents and there's a rule which picks out, quote, just generated events, so present events, and gives you new events. Those present events no longer exist. They have passed on their endowment and information, and they no longer exist, and you have a new event. So that's the fundamental picture, the continual recreation of events. 
Um, let me take a moment to mention something about the rules by which we generate new events from old events. Um, because there's a, a last part of the story, if, you don't, if, I, if I'm not indulging too much, which I want to... It's perfect. I, I was going to ask about the rules, please. Good. So um, Julian Barber and I, studying the notions of complex systems and so forth, quite a long time ago, um, invented a measure of complexity of a system of relations. So this is applicable to any kind of system that's describable as a graph or a network where there are relations and you can talk about the view of a vertex or a subsystem of the rest of the system. And the notion is called the variety. And it basically is defined the following way. If, if I want to talk about the variety of a graph, um, consider any two nodes of the graph and look at the subgraph containing them and going one step out and the subgraphs going two steps out and three steps out and so forth. And those are a way of talking about the view of the subsystems of the graph defined by the nodes. And we wanna know, are they distinct one, two, three, n steps out? And that gives us a notion of how different is the view of each of those two nodes. And then we can sum that overall pair of nodes and that's the variety. And so, we, sorry, so that, so that structure is like the grammar of that gives rise to the appearance of the rules, the, the causality? Yes, yeah, so, so with Julian, um, this is back in the late 80s or so, we, conjectured and played with the idea that the, the action principle of the universe really wants to extremize the, the variety of the universe, the distinction, the degree of distinction between the views of each subset in, in general. And that is built into the causal theory of view. So the rule that picks out which events are going to be the co-parents of a new event is chosen so as to increase the overall variety of the system. So the, the part of the action principle I talked about is a potential energy that measures the variety of the system. And I now, what, so that's the fundamental dynamics. Um, how do particles emerge? So I just have events, boing, 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 boing. But because sometimes there can be an event that has a dominant source, a dominant contribution to its energy and coming into it and a dominant contribution to its energy going out of it. So you can sometimes identify in the solutions of the model, one dimensional series, which dominate the conservation of energy. And one can work out what is the action principle for those. And not surprisingly, in the limit in which there are many, many of these events, um, the action principle reduces to the action principle of the relativistic particle. So the, the notion of the relativistic particle emerges naturally from the, and that's not really surprising because I've put in the conservation laws, which, so it's not surprising that I get out the only, if I'm gonna get something moving in Minkowski space time, I get out the simplest evolution law consistent with that. But th that's, that's what happens. 
Are the, are the conservation laws definite or indefinite? When we apply them, they're definite. They are at an event, and that's for, that's uh, that's very important. They're they're definite. So that well, let me these ones. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. I think I was interrupting, but there, there was another uh, audience member who had a question. Um, but I think if I'm interrupting the the explanation you were giving to Adam, then uh, please continue. Up to Adam, do, do, were we interrupted? I, I think that was a simple question. You provided a simple answer. I'm satisfied. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then David has a question. Yes. Uh, my, my question is, um, is there a, a, a parsimonious version of this theory? I think I should probably read the papers, but just out of curiosity, is, is there a parsimonious version that um, speaks only of the things that exist, namely the, the events, and does not mention things like the past and the future until they emerge as emergent properties? I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of um, basically the Page Wouters um, formalism in which uh, they start by saying there's no such thing as, or things don't change in time. And then they work their way towards an emergent uh, uh, property of this system in which time does happen. So, but, but they start with a system that basically doesn't have change in it at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very different kind of system. Um, <laughs> Parsimonious. So what? So the 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 simple answer is no, not yet. Um, the there is a paper which is about to come out by Kelly and myself, which presents this view of indefinite to definite, replacing the notions of past, present, and future. Um, there is a paper which is about to come out, which does something which is really just something of technical importance, which is it greatly simplifies the derivation from this action principle I've been mentioning based on the variety to the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation in, in a certain limit. There are three papers which already have versions of that derivation and there are parts of those derivations, which to me were too lengthy and kind of ugly. So I found a way to greatly simplify that. And that's, that's of course not, that's very important for me, um, but it's not addressing these fundamental issues. Um, there, there is a lot that we have to do. Um, we, the derivation of relativistic quantum theory is in progress, but there are some technical issues. The derivation of general relativity um, is in progress and I, I have a strategy and there are pieces of that, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been shown completely yet. Um, and so, it's there, uh, there is, there is a lot to talk about, but there isn't everything I would like there to be, certainly. But you can understand. Um, a question that I had is, uh, are, are, are you thinking about a finite number of events or, or is there a continuum of them? Um, this, I certainly am thinking of a discrete theory. Um, right. One place that this comes from, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what we call relative locality, but that's a continuum theory which addresses a question about Lorentz invariance in quantum gravity. And one place that the energetic causal set formulation comes from is making a discrete version of the idea of relative locality. And let me, again, you tell me if I'm indulging, 
Posing, but let me mention what uh, relative locality is about because it's another view of how space dissolves in into little pieces which are held together by conservation of momentum and energy. So, if you thought about special relativity um, and quantum gravity, which many of us have you might have been worried about the following question. Um, if I believe that there is a length scale, the Planck length, below which there's something called quantum geometry, which is different from classical geometry, then, and I say that there's a threshold, if I look smaller than the threshold of L Planck, where L Planck is square root of H bar G, over C cubed, I think. Um, then there's a conceptual problem because uh, somebody can come along and say, but I'm going to make a Lorentz transformation and all the laws have to be the same. But m that length, that threshold is going to Lorentz contract and it'll be different if, if for a different observer in a different frame of reference. And that sounds wrong. In fact, that sounds like an argue, the beginning of an argument that Lorentz invariance has to fail in quantum gravity, which I think a number of people have thought. But you can take another attitude. You can say, I'm going to do the trick of special relativity again. So I'm going to say that there are transformation laws between observations of length and time intervals and energy and momentum going from inertial frame to inertial frame, which preserve one speed, namely the speed of light, and one length, namely the Planck length. And I, if you try to do that, you discover it surprisingly you can. And you can, it, you can reproduce a relativistic dynamics in which there is preservation. There is, in other words, there's a universal length scale as well as a universal speed. Now, why that's called relative locality is that after some years of studying that, and that idea was invented first by Giovanni Leonardo Camellia, and then by Jean Maguejo and myself, and then a number of other people got involved and it was it and it's it made some interesting phenomenological predictions and it was a thing you might say for about 10 years and then Sabina Hassenfelder some of you may have heard of or read um, objected that there it, if you that in that theory she could find non-local interactions that were necessarily there and that therefore the whole thing was nonsense. And um, there was nice dramatic arguing of the kind we used to do when we all could work in the same building in the same room. And a lot of people got irritated and angry, but she was right, but not completely right. Because what we discovered is that you could use those transformation laws to put the non-locality far from you, if, if by you, you mean you're an observer in this relativistic space time. So in some particular experiment, like measuring whether the speed of light has an energy dependence, where you do that by looking at a gamma ray, which is produced maybe 10 billion light years away in a gamma ray burst, and some infrared photon and you watch, they both proceed towards us. And if the speed of light has some energy dependence, one may arrive before the other. And that was the kind of experiment that has been really done to check these theories. Of course, they haven't seen anything, but what we found is that the non-locality, there is first non-locality present in that physics and it's non-locality 
which however, we can always, if we're an observer, transform it far away. And so the discrete theories that I described to you in the pasting together of the little pieces of dual momentum space come from the study of that theory because just to describe in, in a few sentences, and I'll be technical and interrupt me if, you, if somebody wants a less technical description of it, but we usually describe relativistic particles in what we call a phase space, which has the space time. And at each point in the space time, there is a space of momentum, which are possible momenta passing through that point of space time. It's called the dual space or the covariant space. And when we go to general relativity, we curve space time and the momentum spaces remain flat spaces, which are tangent to the curved space time. So the theory I've just described is exactly the opposite. Momentum space turns out to curve or have non-trivial torsion or non-metricity. And the curved momentum space has tangents, which are little pieces of space time. And in this continuum theory, you can ask whether you can consistently sew those little infinitesimal pieces of space time together to make a consistent space time. And the answer is when certain equations of motion and conservation laws are satisfied, you can. So that so that's the continuum limit that the theory that I've been telling you about, if if everything is right in the world, goes to. Did, did that help? Yes. Um, I had a further question, which is that if you, if your your underlying events are can finite or discrete, then uh, does that mean something for the topology of space time? For example, uh, I believe that if you have a discrete kind of view of space time, then you can't have things like closed time like curves, for example. Is, is that correct? So in, in, uh, and if so, aren't you losing some of the interesting topology of, of space time? That's, a, that's in a personal take, I think, a personal opinion. Um, so yes, um, there are no there are no time like curves, closed causal curves in this theory by construction. That is, um, in the dynamics which is continually constructing new events, there is nothing that would allow the system to return to an earlier event. And let me say why. The, I, it's implicit in what I said before about variety. One of the things we believe about the solutions of this theory when the number of events is large is that there are no two events that have the same view. And this is up to symmetries and so forth. So there really are no two events which, which, which have the same view. And therefore, there are no symmetries. That is, there are, in, uh, there are no symmetries in the theory. And this is already a property of classical general relativity. That is, you can show that there are no symmetries on the configuration space of classical general relativity with spatially compact boundary conditions. That's a theorem of Karl Kukash from about 1972. And so the hope that I think some people expressed of going around a closed timeline curve is essentially equivalent to saying that there's a symmetry that takes the world at one time to a translation of the world in such a way that you believe you 
come back to the same moment that is in your past. That, that's a statement of asymmetry. And um, so I, my, my view of time is, is in conflict with the idea of a closed timeline curve. And um, I think that I think that's good. And let me let me say one more thing about that. Um, and here the collab this goes in so many directions. And um, but let me go down this one for a minute. Um, and this came from the collaboration with Roberto Mankinberg Unger. Um, it simplifies the the theater of action, so to speak, or the scene of the crime, or however you want to talk about modern fundamental physics, to just sweep away, uh, just declare there is one universe, and just sweep away all that baggage and litter. And I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings by being really pejorative about it. But I think that the stuff about many universes in cosmology is a bit silly and has made it hard to think. And let me point out, I'm not talking about the many worlds that are ever at quantum mechanics, where, where I have enormous respect for the people who are developing that. And I have a different point of view, but I, I think it's a, that's a very important development. Uh, I'm talking about the, whoa, there's eternal inflation and there's an infinite number of bubbles and on and on. And we come in many copies and there are right now 20 copies of myself giving something like this talk. There, you know, that, that kind of stuff seems to me is, is not a productive direction. And one of the reasons why is I think that the important question in cosmology is why is this one universe the way it is? That is, we start with the insistence that there is just one universe and the job of science is to understand it, to find, as David would say, the best explanation. And the language of many possible universes um, only makes that job harder. So, um, so that whole bunch, so I'm, and once you accept the idea that there is just one universe and we're trying to explain it, um, you, there's something which is not very comfortable that we have to expect, we have to absorb, which is that it might've been different. That one universe has some properties and there are other possible universes that have different properties. And for some reason, this is the real universe and that's not. And I know this goes against a lot of contemporary thinking and metaphysics and so forth, and possible universes and so forth. But I, I think that following the track set down by there is one universe and we're gonna understand it, um, takes us to a better place, if I can put it that way. Great, thanks so much for the answer. Um, then I think we have another question by Sadia. Uh, so if you would like to, to ask the question, Sadia, feel, feel free to go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Dr. Smolin. Um, I have a question. Um, it kind of, I wasn't sure if you were gonna get into it later on. It's about uh, a bunch of principles that you laid down um, in your book as well. And one of the, them being the principle of precedence. Yeah. Um, and its relation, uh, do you, are you going to be talking about it? Because I could wait for my question and you might actually just No, I, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not going to, I will talk about it now since, why don't you ask your question 
and I'll talk about it. I'll be happy to talk about it. All right. So I've been trying to make sense of this whole thing about um, uh, you mentioned something that, you know, uh, in your theory, it's um, time is serving or causality is there is sort of like a generative principle, right? Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that there may be some unprecedented events. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of a little bit curious as to, has there been any development on, or any thoughts on what generates those? Like what part of your theory is generating? I don't even know how to, add, because it's, it's really, it's so kind of mind blowing that I've been trying to wrap my mind around it. And is that also related to that fundamental asymmetry that you're talking about as well? So I didn't, so the developments that I was talking about today, um, the causal theory of views and everything that that, that descended from does not require the principle of precedence. But let me talk about the context of principle of precedence, which is related in an important way, although not, not it's not necessary. And so I, I didn't mention as part of it. Um, how I got into this whole excursion um, of thinking that time is fundamental in the sense of change and causation. Um, and everything that follows from it was because of a crisis in fundamental physics about our inability to answer the question of what chose the laws of nature. That is um, what we know about the laws of nature is that there are these four forces and we have a pretty good idea of the dynamics of those forces. There may be things we're missing. There may be, say, relations between electromagnetism and gravity that we don't understand yet. Um, but we have the standard model, and it explains in a certain way all that we've observed and about particle physics and atomic physics and so forth. But it has a huge problem which is that it has 29 tunable dimensionless parameters, as well as a number of other parameters, discrete parameters like a gauge group, representations of the gauge group. And so to specify the standard model, we have to specify all these dimensionless constants and these other choices. And the question that I, in my opinion, we should be asking now is what chose the laws? Because I think that's the most important thing to have the best explanation. Um, to, if I can quote um, Charles Sanders Peirce, it's not enough. This is 1893, roughly, the architecture of theories. It's not enough to explain the phenomena in terms of the laws. If we want a complete or best explanation, we have to explain where the laws come from, what chose the laws. And then Peirce goes on to say, the only kind of explanation that would be scientific, that has involved something causally happening in the world, which also has, may have experimental consequences by means of which it can be checked, is if there's something analogous to natural selection in biology. And there's a notion of the laws evolving by natural selection. He really said that in 1893. And, um, and I understood that that was a problem in about, 1988 and have been worrying about it. That's the core of my concern. And if there is a dynamical mechanism or some kind of causal mechanism 
that explains how those parameters are chosen, then time is fundamental. The laws change and evolve. They're not fundamental built-in platonic structures the way that we often think or dream. They're parts of nature that change along with everything else. So then the burden is on me to present mechanisms that might be checked for how the laws would evolve. And one of them was a, a scenario very much inspired by natural selection. And that is called cosmological natural selection. And it makes even some predictions and it's been studied. Not very much, but I think it's, it's on the table as a real hypothesis. The principle of precedence is another attempt to give a principle or a dynamics by which the laws could evolve. And yes, there is some recent development. Um, and it, when I finish what I'm about to say, well, it's part of a long work, which we're just publishing and putting on the archive now with Jeremy Meir, if you know him. Um, he's an influential computer scientist and Stefan Alexander and a number of younger colleagues from Microsoft Research. And this is a funny thing that I'm about to say, and you'll think, well, I knew he was crazy, but this is really crazy. So um, there's been a lot of study of and working with these, quote, machine learning algorithms. And I've been very puzzled by these for a few years. And um, I think a lot of people are puzzled because if you take it seriously, um, certainly these, these they're, they're machines, they're algorithms, certainly they learn in some sense. But that's really weird. Can, are there, what does it mean to learn? What does it mean for a, a physical phenomenon to learn? And so we got interested in this. And um, long story short, so this is the subject of a paper that's just being released with those people called the Autodidactic Universe. Um, we develop uh, an answer to the question of how, what, learn, what is learning for natural systems in the world. And we end up asking if the laws of physics might evolve by learning. And that, that along the way addresses some of what were open questions about how to realize the principle of precedence. So that's, that's, there's much more to say about that, but I, I, I'll stop there. So the one, just one comment on that or question. So you would, would you say that you're looking into the possibility of learning uh, being one of those unprecedented events? And would that also mean that some of the laws that we might discover uh, uh, might not be like we might not be able to derive them from fundamental physics. I mean, is that what something unprecedented would mean, right? That the laws that govern the behavior in some sense would... Because see, when I looked at your book on um, cosmological natural selection, to me, it felt like there was a mechanism there that at least, you know, like what you mentioned in your uh, book, uh, Einstein's Unfinished Revolution, uh, you mentioned about maybe creating some uh, like a possible experiment where we might create some sort of a novel state. Yes. And yes. then discovering that there may be, uh, you know, that really kind of almost like, I, I don't know what to make of it. So I thought I would, I would ask you if you could shed some more light on that. Yeah. But. So let me say what you're referring to. So part of the view that I've been and other people have been developing is 
the question of whether the evolution of the universe is deterministic or whether there can be new properties which emerge and there can be surprises. There can be things that happen that we could not have anticipated with even knowing as much as we can know about the laws of nature. This for me is an open question. Um, there are a number of people I know who are pursuing different versions of it. Now the principle of precedence starts off in a different direction. Basically to make it very short, um, if I have a quantum mechanical system, I'm gonna talk about it operationally. We prepare it, we evolve it a certain amount of time in a certain environment, which is described by a Hamiltonian or a unitary evolution. And then we measure it. And if we do this at different times and keep records of the measurements, the observations, we find that there's a, there, there's a table or a matrix of probabilities which describes the probability for a, a, an input state to be such and such or an output state to be such and such if the input state is chosen such a way. And assuming that the forces were held constant, we integrate the Schrodinger equation or apply the unitary time evolution operator. And we always get the same probabilities. And so I looked at that and I said, um, maybe the reason why we always get the same probabilities is that there's just one law, which is if a quantum system is asked to become definite, that is to given a basis of choices to express and one of them will become definite and the others will become definitely not the case. Um, maybe the law is not construct a Hamiltonian unitary operator and integrate and blah, 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 blah. But just look at the ensemble of past instances of similar systems and pick randomly one of the outcomes. And if you make that the, the law of nature, it preserves itself so that use of precedence um, replaces the idea that there are fixed laws in nature. And that I think is an interesting idea. I don't know if it's true, um, but that's the idea that I've been trying to develop. And then the question is, what happens if there is no precedence? So what happens if, I'm sure there at Oxford, there are people working in quantum computing who are making large entangled states using ion traps or something like that, or out of photons or something. And they may be making states which have, which have sufficient combinatorial complexity that they don't exist naturally. They have never existed. So I go to the experimentalist and I say, can you make, can you try to make for me a, a quantum state, an entangled quantum state, which has never existed naturally? And because I want to understand how such a thing gets dynamics because it, it, this may refute the proposal of the idea of precedence, or it may explain to us how precedence develops and arises. So is that, so is, that's your question, if I understand it. Yes, and I guess I also worry that if in, a, uh, in, in the sort of world you're proposing where time is, um, uh, fundamental or causality, uh, then something like that, uh, I, I was actually wondering how that would fit in with the um, principle of sufficient reason. Because, you know, if you have a world, a timeless view of the world, you can always say, well, we're just discovering something, right? That was already there, some sort of a relation. But here we're saying that 
something that didn't exist before uh, unless if you can explain how, but, but I guess the whole idea of something being un unprecedented, if I understand it correctly, is that whatever law uh, that we're gonna find uh, uh, that governs the behavior of that novel um, or the evolution of that novel state will not be derivable from the other uh, fundamental laws of physics, right? That's yeah. what I was Right. So I, that's a direction of thought, and I am I am trying to pursue that. Um, the new paper on machine machines that learn um, addresses it a little bit, and let me just state the main results of that paper, since I'm mentioning it and it's not been published. Um, the main result is that there is a three-way correspondence between three types of systems. One of them is a quantum field theory. One of them is what's called a matrix model, which physicists know is a certain approximation to a quantum field theory that we know how to study. And one of them is uh, some is a formal model of a machine learning algorithm. And we're able to establish a three-way correspondence. And that's and that suggests that if there is a process which chooses a quantum field theory um, that goes on in the early universe or sometime in the universe. Um, it may be formally analogous to the how a, uh, a certain machine learning algorithm will, will recognize, so given a task to recognize something. In other words, the, 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 the construction of a stable ground state of the quantum field theory is formally analogous to the algorithm solving a recognition problem. And so that's, that's the result. And um, I don't know if that we spend a section on how that could address the, the principle of precedence issue. And, but we don't, we don't resolve it. Um, just to briefly interject, so we're uh, nearing the usual end of the event. Uh, however, I think the discussion session is quite nice. Um, so if you would like to, we could continue, but I'm, um, I'm mindful of your yeah, time. I'm very, I'm very grateful for all these questions. So Good. I'm happy to go on. I might just, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been a battle going on between me and the sun coming from that window. So I'll just move around so that we win. I'm also aware that we we somewhat interrupted your slides. Um, no, that's this is fine. Okay, great. Um, then yeah, there's two more questions, and also I think I I somewhat interrupted uh, Sadia's question. So if she is satisfied you... with the answer, then um, I can go to someone else. But otherwise, please, Sadia, you can uh, come back and, and. No, I'm I'm good. I'll I'll let. Uh... Dr. Smolin, continue. I'll jump in later on. I can say one thing in about what we learned, and that's that's that part of a system choosing a quantum mechanical laws is the discovery of unitary evolution, unitary dynamics. And what we find is that in a space of possible statistical laws for the evolution of one of our systems, and this is very much in the spirit of Lucien Hardy and the generalized probability theories, um, dis discovering a quantum theory as opposed to a more as opposed to a generalized probabilistic evolution law means discovering a unitary operator 
in the space of larger operators. And I don't know if this is new or not, but we discover that that happens essentially by the discovery of a, um, of a closed loop. This comes back to the question about time and going around cycles of time, but finding a closed loop of states um, in a limit, this is called the limit cycle. And the problem is formally analogous to problems that people know a lot about in which limit cycles form. So we have a dynamic which is dominated by the formation of limit cycles that turn out to trans to be associated with unitary operators. And that's how the quantum system emerges from the more generalized probability system. So that's, that's another of the results in this paper. You can tell I'm proud of this paper. <laughs> and I think we have, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, so I just wanted to say that. Uh, in that case, uh, Salisa, I, I hope you're pronouncing your name right. I see you have your hand raised. If you want to ask a question, please go ahead. Oh, hello, my name is Salisa. Uh, I'm an engineer and I'm an amateur astronomer. I'm focusing on contributing to measuring distant galaxies for okay. the expansion of the universe um, in amateur way. My question for Professor Smolin is, after listening to his principle of precedent, and how he talks about how time is fundamental to understand um, how laws change. Uh, I, I want to know what's his opinion on, does he find value on finding the answer to the question, what caused the Big Bang? If he finds mm -hmm. doctor for science to go to find the event that caused everything, I'm in between two outcomes, either we will chase that beginning forever, or maybe we'll find that it's one primal event and from there. And if you find value on answering this question. So yes, I do. Um, I, I am not very attracted to the idea that the first moment of time, whatever that would mean, is only 13 point something billion years ago. Um, in my own work, I don't have much useful to say or much new that there are people in quantum gravity and as you know, in cosmology, studying the possibility that the universe, that our universe are, is the result of some violent event or some a bounce, sometimes we call it. And I think that that's an interesting line of work. And I, I hope that it develops. I, I'm a little bit, um, I think there are too many models which are studied. So there's a lot of discussion over not what the real universe might have done, but how a, mo a certain model of quantum gravity or quantum cosmology behaves. But I, I think that's a, that's a very important set of questions. And of course, Roger Penrose is somebody who comes to mind. And whatever you think of his proposals for a balance, he always is presenting a prediction by which the idea could be tested. The host has stopped my sharing. Oh, uh, sorry, yes, I... Is that because I mentioned Roger? <laughs> no, I, uh, I saw that the slides are still open and I thought that if we, um, yeah, sorry, I thought if we're not gonna return to them, I could view you in full screen. Good, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, sorry, sorry for the interruption there. Uh, I hope that's all right. I'm still seeing, should I get out of slide sharing? Um, I think it doesn't matter for us, the viewers, uh, but it is whatever you prefer. I'd like to see, uh, to see the people in the audience. So 
Tell me what to do. I'm looking at Keynote now. Uh, right. Right. Um, I think if you yes, I um, either close Keynote or, or move back to Zoom, there we it are. should be possible to, to view the audience. No, thank you. Great. Oh, wow, there's a lot of people here. Yes. Okay, I would have been nervous if I knew Zoom. Anyway, go ahead with the questions. Uh, yeah, sorry. So again, sorry for the interruption. Uh, so no Lisa, is your, was your question answered? And uh, if not, then please let us know. Uh, if, yeah, if that's all right, then I guess we'll move to Charles. Charles, great to see you and go ahead. Yes, thanks, Sam. And th thank you uh, for the nice talk, uh, Professor Smolin. That's very interesting. My question is, I, actually, I'm kind of uh, just taking the invitation since you mentioned that this was an obvious question. I'm very curious about an explanation of how um, reversible laws, reversible, time reversible laws can emerge from fundamentally irreversible processes. Good, so, the, so this came from the work with Marina Cortez and um, it's, I was just discussing an instance of it. So what we found happens in our energetic causal set models, the, where there's some models I mentioned in one plus one dimensions where she is able on a computer to solve and study the evolution. And what happens is that at first the evolution is very time irreversible. And then it go, there's a phase transition in time. And as the system evolves, it reduces the effective phase space shrinks to a space of limit cycles where the system is quasi reversible. And what I mean by quasi reversible is that, um, the long time behavior is just to follow this limit cycle around and around in a circle as, as indeed is always the case with unitary evolution. Um, since you know the whole cycle, you could reverse it and you could have the impression that the fundamental dynamics is reversible, but the true fundamental dynamics is not reversible because there are some states which have more than one antecedent, but you never see that because the cycles are only being traveled in one direction. So it corresponds to the following. If I could make a theory of electromagnetism based only on retarded potentials, that is only on giving initial data for the electromagnetic potentials and evolving them into the future. Um, and I replaced the usual theory of electrodynamics with, in some sense, half of the theory of electrodynamics, which consisted only of those solutions which propagate information to the future and doesn't include in the space of solutions solutions that propagate that are the time reversal of those. Um, that could be the world we live in. And the fact is that the time reversal of the solutions that we see are not actually solutions of the true theory, but they're solutions of the truncated theory that truncates the state space just to the limit cycle. And we can so and we can see that happening explicitly in these models. That raises a next question, which we also spent some time on, which is if the fundamental theory is originally a time irreversible theory, then there ought to be extensions of general relativity coupled to electromagnetism and Yang Mills fields and so forth, which are time irreversible. Well, so that we could explicitly model and study for possible observational signals um, a 
time irreversible extension of general relativity coupled to other fields. And we discovered that there are such theories, such, such extensions of general relativity, which are time irreversible, but which evolve over time to jettison the degrees of freedom that make or freeze the degrees of freedom that are responsible for the irreversibility and shrink down to the configuration space of just the reversible theory, which is general relativity. Um, and I'm happy to give references. I couldn't say any more without getting pretty technical. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Th but thank you, it was still a very detailed... Uh, I yes, have look, sorry, look for a paper by um, Enrique Gomez and um, Rina and myself and Andrew Little. And there are a couple of papers on that idea and some signatures, cosmological signatures in that. Okay. Um, well, I have it. I don't know if it, I, it might, I think it's not really related. Uh, Sam, if there's, if there's another question, maybe I should leave it because I don't want to be hijacking. Yeah. Okay. My, not, my other question is about, um, not sure I can formulate it properly, but if, if time is treated in a completely different footing than space, how can we recover curvature in time-space planes uh, once we want to get to general relativity as opposed to flat Minkowski space? Yes, that's a good question. Um, Um, since we haven't completed that part of the work, I I have some speculations, but I don't I don't have something that I I can tell you what I'm trying, but maybe that would that would be a waste of time at this point. Um, <laughs> I'll mention one thing I'm no longer trying, but is I think interesting to know about, which is there's a, a version or a modification of general relativity called shape dynamics invented by a number of young people. Um, and this is about 10, 12 years ago at Perimeter. And that version of general relativity has preferred spatial slices and gives up the refoliation gauge invariance where you can change the spatial slices in exchange for a, a local scale invariant. So that essentially general relativity becomes reformulated as something like a conformal field theory, but with a fixed notion of time. And that opens up some possibility for, for understanding what you're asking. Okay, thank you. But nobody has worked that out in detail. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, in that case, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you very, very much. This has been a, a wonderful experience for me. Thank you. Likewise. Very interesting.